This is the seventh video in a series of videos about glaucoma training. Module 7. Assessment of the anterior segment. The learning objectives for this module are 1. To know the normal anatomy of the anterior angle of the eye. 2. To understand the various changes that can occur at the angle in glaucoma. 3. To know how to examine and grade the angle using Van Herrick's technique. And 4. To understand how to examine and describe the angle using gonioscopy. Assessment of the anterior segment and anterior chamber angle. Assessment of the anterior segment and anterior chamber angle will help you to identify important signs of glaucoma, including some of the key risk factors. This examination is essential where glaucoma is present or suspected. Looking carefully at the anterior segment can also help you identify coexisting pathologies that may be related to glaucoma. Recognising signs and knowing how to act on any abnormalities that you detect will inform your decisions on monitoring, treatment and referral. NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in England. Recommendations on glaucoma case finding can be found within the NICE guideline NG81 published in November 2017. It's available at the link on the slide. These recommendations are designed to be used by primary eye care optometrists in England prior to referral for diagnosis of chronic open angle glaucoma, COAG, and related conditions. NICE recommends that patients should be offered all of the tests on the following slide before referral for further investigation and diagnosis of COAG and related conditions. We talk about the NICE guidelines uh, in this training uh, as it is a good benchmark uh, to consider your practice by. So, tests that we would uh, want to complete. Central visual field assessment using standard automated perimetry, either full threshold or supra threshold. Optic nerve assessment and fundus examination using stereoscopic slit lamp biomicroscopy with pupil dilatation if necessary, and optical coherence tomography, OCT, or an optic head, nerve head image if available. Intraocular pressure, IOP measurement, using Goldman type applanation tonometry. Peripheral anterior chamber configuration, and depth assessments using gonioscopy or if not available or the patient prefers the Van Herrick test or OCT. This requirement is new as of 2017. NICE is clear that patients should not be referred to hospital eye services solely on the basis of an IOP measurement of 24 millimetres of mercury or above using non-contact tonometry. The anterior chamber, AC, filled with aqueous humour, maintains the pressure in the eye and inflates the globe. The anterior chamber depth, ACD, is deepest centrally, directly under the corneal apex and narrows as the cornea curves to the limbus. The anterior chamber angle, ACA, is the space between the iris and the corneal endothelium at the limbus with the trabecular meshwork at the apex. Assessment of the anterior chamber 
is important in identifying risk factors for glaucoma. Checking the anterior chamber angle, the central corneal thickness, and identifying any pathology that may be present will help with diagnosis and enable comparisons at later examinations. When assessing the anterior chamber, you must pay particular attention to the anterior chamber angle, also known as the aridocorneal angle, as a method of estimating the risk of angle closure glaucoma. The lens thickens with age, which in turn pushes forward the iris, narrowing the anterior chamber angle and reducing the anterior chamber depth. This can significantly affect the drainage route of the aqueous humour, causing a build-up of intraocular pressure. Here is a schematic diagram of the anterior chamber angle, showing all the significant landmarks. The examination of the anterior eye with a slit lamp is an essential part of the glaucoma investigation. Firstly, assess the whole of the anterior eye, including the conjunctiva, cornea, iris and lens in white light, looking for signs of pathology and conditions that may indicate a risk factor for glaucoma or raised IOP. The anterior chamber needs to be viewed with a conical beam in a darkened room to look for the presence of cells, flare or debris that may suggest conditions such as traumatic or uveitic glaucoma. NICE recommends a quantitative assessment of the anterior chamber angle and depth using gonioscopy or the Van Herrick technique to help differentiate between open angle glaucoma and narrow angle pathology. During the anterior chamber assessment, it is possible that you will notice other abnormalities. There are certain features that signal a risk of glaucoma that it is useful to fam familiarize yourself with so that you can look out for them during an examination. Pigment dispersion syndrome, PDS, occurs when pigment cells detach from the back of the iris and float around in the aqueous humour. An early indication that PDS is present is the observation of a Krukenberg spindle situated on the corneal endothelium. See the image. This is often detected during an examination of the cornea. Other signs can be iris transillumination defects in the mid-peripheral iris and or heavy pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork. PDS is normally diagnosed clinically based on the presence of two or more of these three key features in the absence of another cause, such as trauma or surgery. These pigment cells can accumulate in such a way that they begin to clog the trabecular meshwork and result in a rise in the IOP. Detection can be difficult, so use high magnification in a darkened room. Pigment may deposit on the iris, usually accumulating in the furrows. More diffuse deposition may cause the whole iris to deepen in colour. The pigment can be confused with pigment changes occurring post-cataract surgery on the endothelium. Check whether the patient has any pre-existing eye conditions and consider any other signs that can aid diagnosis during the anterior segment examination. This image shows the angle of a young female with pigment dispersion syndrome. 
examination showed prominent Krukenberg spindle and iris transillumination defects. Note the dense pigment in the trabecular meshwork and the pigment obscuring the ciliary body and scleral spur. Despite the extensive pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork, this patient demonstrated no evidence of glaucoma. Pseudoexfoliation syndrome, PXF, is an age-related condition more common in women than men that greatly increases the risk of glaucoma. It is characterized by the accumulation of white granular material at the anterior lens capsule surface. The granular flakes can be seen under close examination in several parts of the eye, including the anterior chamber structures and the trabecular meshwork. Deposits of this material in the trabecular meshwork can result in aqueous outflow obstruction, raised IOP and glaucoma. The Van Herrick technique is a method used to determine the risk of angle closure glaucoma and to get an estimate of the peripheral anterior chamber depth. Setting up your equipment properly and ensuring the lighting conditions are correct is important for the accuracy of this relatively simple procedure. Once set up, it is a straightforward and quick technique to perform. A Van Herrick assessment is important to do as it is a quick way to try and work out if a patient might have open angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma. If you suspect that a patient has a narrow angle and is at risk of angle closure, you will need to know the referral route for the patient to be seen urgently by an ophthalmologist. Ensure the contact surfaces are cleaned with alcohol wipes when setting up for the Van Herrick technique. For patient comfort and accuracy, adjust the chair and slit lamp to the correct height. Align the patient's eye using the chin rest adjuster. Ensure that the eye lines up with the alignment marker. Dim the room lights. Magnification 10 times to 16 times with a white filter and narrow beam. And move the angle of the slit lamp illumination to be exactly 60 degrees. Once set, you can lock the illumination system to stop it moving during the measurement. Here is a schematic diagram of the Van Herrick technique when it is set up. The Van Herrick Technique Assessment Obtain a thin, clear section in the apex of the cornea, then reduce the height of the slit lamp to 3 to 4 millimetres. When you can see a clear, short corneal section, carefully move the light over to the temporal side of the cornea, ensure it is clear and focused on the limbus. You can then compare the space between the corneal and iris light projections to determine the depth of the angle. This is determined by grading the measurement. Taking the measurement. With the slit on the very edge of the cornea, you can increase the magnification further if required. You will see both the corneal section and scattered light off the iris parallel to each other. Whilst the temporal Van Herrick angle is the most commonly assessed, there may be variations in which part of the angle is the most narrow, so consider a Van Herrick estimate taken both temporally and nasally in borderline narrow angle cases. You should be aware of some limitations of the Van Herrick technique. The anterior chamber angle 
can be overestimated if you do not set up the equipment correctly. The slit lamp illumination angle must be at 60 degrees. If the illumination is in the wrong position, it will give the wrong ratios, particularly if the beam is moved too far onto the cornea. Accuracy can also be affected by the integrity of the peripheral cornea or degenerative conditions. The Van Herrick technique does not give you information on the structure of the angle. It is only suitable for assessing horizontal angles. The grading system. The width of the chamber angle can be described by the distance between the corneal slit image and the slit image on the iris. The Van Herrick five-step grading scale compares the depth of the peripheral anterior chamber with the corneal thickness. It is usually expressed as a ratio of the illuminated corneal section to the dark optical space. This gives an estimation of the probability of closure. As shown in the table on the next slide, grade 4 indicates that angle closure is unlikely and grade 0 indicates angle closure has already occurred. This is an important slide for you to look at and learn through grades 4 down to 0 and the ratios that you will see in the middle column and the risk of angle closure in each scenario. Grade 4, the normal eye. The cornea to anterior chamber depth is 1 to 1 or greater. Estimated Van Herrick grade is 4, so the chamber angle is approximately 35 to 45 degrees and closure is very unlikely. Grade 3, the ratio is 1 to a half. The chamber angle is approximately 20 to 35 degrees. The closure is still unlikely. Grade 2, 1 to a quarter. Chamber angle is approximately 20 degrees. And now closure is possible. By the time we get to grade zero, the ratio is one to zero. The chamber angle is zero and the angle is technically closed and there is no black space visible. It is important that you record the Van Herrick grading correctly in your notes and on any referral paperwork as it will form part of your case finding data. For best practice, in England, NICE requests that the results of all examinations and tests are provided with the referral, including the optometrist's findings from the anterior segment slit lamp examination. This is good advice in any health system. If the angle is grade 4 and open, state this. Optical Coherence Tomography OCT. OCT is a non-contact, non-invasive imaging technique that reveals layers of the eye via interface patterns of reflected laser light. It is most commonly associated with examination of the retina, but development of Fourier domain OCT technology also allows imaging of the anterior segment. Different parts of the eye can be imaged using OCT although it is important to note that structures behind the iris cannot be visualized with this technology. In an anterior chamber angle examination, OCT offers a clear view of the iris profile and position of the lens with respect to anterior segment structures, meaning that changes such as angle closure can be identified via segment imaging and measurement. These are two photographs 
taken from OCT. The procedure is performed under dark conditions allowing angle assessment during physiological mydriasis. The results produce a clear ultrasound type scan so that details of the anterior chamber can be seen and the measurement of the anterior chamber angle is possible with built-in software. OCT can also be used to estimate central corneal thickness it is currently best used as an additional assessment tool rather than the sole basis on which a referral is made. Gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is the gold standard of anterior chamber angle assessment, typically used in a hospital setting but can be used within community optometry. Anterior chamber angle assessment using gonioscopy is essential to accurately classify glaucoma or identify a risk factor for developing glaucoma. It is used to assess the proximity of angle structures, determine angle topography and identify abnormal angle features. So with angle anatomy, Orient yourself by finding the pupil. Then follow the iris out to the ciliary body. Although the colour of the ciliary body will vary depending on the colour of the iris, the ciliary body will be darker than the iris. People with brown uh, irises will have a dark brown ciliary body. The ciliary body may be light brown or grey in patients with lighter irises. Moving anteriorly, the next structure is the scleral spur, bright white because it is a projection of scleral tissue. There is a little variation in the colour of the scleral spur, making this a good landmark to determine which structures are visible. The trabecular meshwork is next to the scleral spur with a whitish grey colour that is not as bright white as the scleral spur. The trabecular meshwork will often appear grey or pink and has a meshy appearance. If there is pigment in the trabecular meshwork, the trabecular meshwork will appear to have two distinct layers. Schwalb's line is the determination of decimase membrane. It indicates the anterior border of the angle. In some patients, it is not easy to identify, but you may see a white ridge in other patients. Occasionally, pigment will deposit, deposit, deposit this ridge and Schwalb's line will appear pigmented as seen in the photo on the following slide. The anterior, area anterior to Schwalb's line is made by reflections off the cornea. Here is a photograph showing the various landmarks in the anterior chamber angle. So for gonioscopy assessment, using a gonio lens and a slit lamp, gonioscopy gives you a direct view into the angle to assess which angle structures are visible beyond the iris. It also gives you a 360 degree view of the anterior chamber. Abnormalities within the angle, such as pigment deposition and neovascular growth can be detected. The width of the angle can be graded depending on which structures are visible. The gonio lens is placed directly onto the eye and held in place throughout the examination. Gonio lenses are available in one, two, three and four mirror designs. A four mirror lens requires less rotation. Assessment of gonioscopy images and interpreting the results requires skill and accuracy. This comes with practice. 
A grading system enables the recording of gonioscopic findings for communication and for future reference. Recognised systems include the Shia system, the Schaefer system and the Spieth system. The Spieth grading system relies on three separate features of the anterior chamber angle anatomy. Iris insertion, angular approach of the iris and the curvature of the peripheral iris. Iris insertion, the most posterior angle structure visible on gonioscopy determines the iris insertion, designated by a capital letter. A means it's anterior to Schwalbe's line, B it's between Schwalbe's line and the scleral spur, in C, the scleral spur is visible. D, it's deep with the ciliary body visit visible. And E, the iris insertion is extremely deep with more than one millimetre of ciliary body visible. This mnemonic helps to remember the designation. Above or below Schwalbe's line, scleral spur, deep, extremely deep. The angular approach of the iris. The angular approach of the peripheral iris to the recess of the anterior chamber angle is assessed with two tangential lines. One line is tangential to the inner surface of the trabecular meshwork. The other line is tangential to the middle third of the anterior iris surface. The angle formed by these two lines defines the angular approach and is denoted from naught to 50 degrees or greater for a very broad angular approach. It is important to realize that this angle does not identify the angle of the iris recess itself, but rather the angular approach of the iris to this recess. The curvature of peripheral iris. The curvature of the peripheral iris is described by a lowercase letter. B means it's bowed anteriorly with a convex curve where the iris arises steeply from its root at the ciliary body. P is a plateau iris configuration. F would be flat without significant forward or backward arching. And C is concave with posterior bowing or a concave appearance. In the Spieth gonioscopy grading system, the individual anterior chamber angle configuration is designated with a code consisting of one capital letter, one number and one lowercase letter. For example, an anterior chamber angle with the iris insertion posterior to the scleral spur, with a normal angular approach and flat peripheral iris configuration would be described as D40F. In addition to the three main factors of angular configuration, you can also comment on features such as the pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork that is, the amount and colour, the pigment puddling, regularity or irregularity of pigment deposition. Also the presence of peripheral anterior synechiae and the details of iris processes. Such features of the anterior chamber angle are commented upon separately from the grading description. A case study. Richard Palmer, who's 48, Afro-Caribbean. He's come because he's been recalled for an annual eye examination. His mother has glaucoma. He has no reported medical history. And he has an open angle by Van Herrick's technique, graded as three, and confirmed open on gonioscopy. It is reassuring that Richard's results show an open angle 
but as he has some recognised risk factors for glaucoma, what other case-finding measures would you recommend? Well, it would be advisable to follow the NICE case-finding guidelines and measure Richard's IOP, his visual fields, and carefully examine the optic disc with indirect ophthalmoscopy. You should record your results for each of these, even if you have no concerns. And in summary, the depth of the anterior chamber naturally decreases with age, increasing the risk of narrow and closed angle glaucoma. A thorough assessment using the Van Herrick technique or gonioscopy will help you to capture crucial information about the depth of the anterior chamber and the likelihood of angle closure. Best practice is to provide this information with your referral notes, so familiarising yourself with the tests will benefit your clinical practice and reputation. Make sure that you've achieved the learning outcomes on this module. That you know the normal anatomy of the anterior angle of the eye. That you understand the various changes that can occur at the angle in glaucoma. That you know how to examine and grade the angle using Van Herrick's technique. And that you understand how to examine and describe the angle using gonioscopy. Make sure that you have any questions that you have answered.